So let's just talk about it. Let's say, uh, you know, you've got another week and a half, a little bit, a little bit more than a week and a half. You've obviously, like you said, you love watching disc golf. You're, you, you commentate on a lot of the big events. Where do you see, Hey, if I come out and have a good week, where do you yeah. see yourself stacking up? Cause me and Yuli kind of talked about this. I was shocked seeing Shoestrick, Climo, Rince. I was shocked watching those guys in person at USCGC when they did that skins match about the level of play they had. And I was like, dang, like, sure, certain courses, it might not translate, but I was like, some courses, their game's going to translate really well. So where do you see yourself if you go out, play well, where do you see yourself stacking up with the field that is, uh, you know, that you're playing in 2024? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. I mean, before all of this, there was only one goal. The, well, the one goal was to just win. I mean, that's it. There was no other, hey, I, I just finishing in top 10. Even once the field started getting bigger, it was always just win. Um, where I sit today right now, I have three goals in mind. One is to complete the tournament, not get injured. You know, I haven't been playing a ton, so I am a little bit, you know, keeping that in mind. Like, I need to keep my body right. You know, stamina is a big deal, especially playing a course that is over, you know, it's like 11,000 feet, uh, the, the gold course there out at Milo. Um, so that's number one. Number two is the cash. I think it would be a big success, honestly, if I was able to cash with limited, uh, you know, time out uh, playing tournaments. And again, with all the great players these days. And then goal number three is to win. And I was just out at Milo about 10 days ago, roughly, and I played a full practice round on the course, um, you know, played all the holes that we're going to play in the tournament. And I shot like a, a, of course, it was a practice round, so I was throwing a lot. But I shot a six down. Um, I had one bogey, seven birdies. I looked at last year's scores. That puts me right about on the cash line. You know, uh, you got to shoot that 10 or 11 per round to win. And that's what you got to do anytime you're playing a big term. I don't care where you are. Can I get there? Maybe. I, I think one round. <laughs> if I shoot a double digits one round, I mean, I might just quit forever because <laughs> that might be the best feeling I've ever had. But uh, no, nah, man, it, look, I'm not, this isn't, I'm not coming back. I am doing this because I love disc golf. I have the opportunity and I just want to be a part of the field with you guys a couple of more times, maybe once, twice, three times a year over the next four or five years before I am just too old. My kid is growing up. Other things are taking me other directions. This is perfect timing for me. I just turned 39 years old and uh, I'm going to give it a couple more spins around the course and see what happens. Love have that. you, uh, have you, how many times have you been watching? Like, let's say the world's and I'm sure it happens at, at courses like the USDGC to where you're commentating and you're just like, man, I should be there. Like it, I should be playing with these guys. You know, like you said, it, it had been, how long has it been since you six years, six years. Yep. Six years. So was year one super difficult for you of not doing it? Dude, I mean, year one was like an absolute whirlwind because it was, I, it was about, it was like f middle of February that Steve Dodge called me and said, Hey, um, we're, there was a lot, there's a whole nother story. There was a lot going on with the pro tour and live commentary and Terry wasn't a part of it. And all this stuff was happening. He said, I need commentators. I, and I didn't, I hadn't even thought of this. But he's like, I have nobody. I can't make it. I, I can't get anybody. And uh, I said, Steve, it's not good timing, man. Like the brewery is going to open up like two weeks after the memorial. And, you know, it was like that year it was like 2019. It was like Memorial Waco. And the list goes on and on and on. And he wanted us to do them all, every mm -hmm. single one of them. And I was like, oh, I don't know, dude. So anyways, long story short, we said yes. And uh, that's where our com my commentating and Val's as well started was just Val and I 
just making it happen, dude. I mean, there was obviously, probably they would have gotten somebody else to do it. Shoot, Steve Dodge would have done it on his own if he had to. But it was such a whirlwind because we were opening the brewery, commentating for like 12, like not quite 12, probably like nine hours a day, nine and a half hours a day on the weekends. And then Monday morning, go right back to work. It was like the seven day a week, 365, no stop. So I didn't even really think about it. But next year, a little bit of the same, that was COVID. I, I didn't think about it much there. It wasn't really until about that third year. So like 2021, when the game again started to get bigger and everybody wanted to talk in the terms that we've kind of been talking in now, this was three years ago where it was like, well, you know, back when you played back, when you played, I'm going, they're playing all the same courses. <laughs> it's all the same players. I, I, there's no difference. It, I, don't, I don't know what you're talking about. So it did creep into my head there, but also, at that time, I was, I, and I still am, very committed to becoming a better commentator, knowing the players' games better, being able to, you know, get across the words that it takes to commentate. So honestly, Yuli, I, I, I haven't even thought about coming back until that USDGC moment when I thought, dude, I just want to see my friends again. I haven't seen yeah. Steve Brinster in five years. I, like, even if I go out to Rock Hill and finish dead last. I mean, I know this sounds crazy and it's kind of an ego thing that you would imagine, but it's not here. If I go and finish dead last, I still would be so thankful to be a part of that field again, play with you guys, be on the practice field with you guys. Cause it's a big difference between talking about you, but then playing with you and being a part of that, that environment again. So that's kind of the mentality right now. Well, and I don't think it's like that. <clears throat> I think that's great because first of all, you belong in the field at that tournament. You earn the right to play that field until you can no longer play anymore. And you want to give your spot up. Like that's, that's part of the perks of being a great champion. You know I what think I mean? It's giving a spot up. I think it's just like, I can't play anymore. <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't think, like, I don't think you're, I don't, I, I don't think you playing in that tournament is taking a spot from someone else. No, no, I think I mean, you're just being once add, you get, you're adding. Right. Well, exactly. But yeah. my point is like at the Masters, eventually, you know, Bernhard Langer, like this year, sure. said, Hey, this I'm is done. my last season. Yeah. I'm done with this tournament. And there's no like I've never been like, why is that dude playing? Like, no, that's freaking Bernhard Langer <laughs> playing at the Masters because my, he's won the tournament. My point is him saying I'm done playing. It's not like them being like, Oh, well, we have to add a new person now. Right, He's right, just right, being, right. yeah, that's what I'm saying. I, yeah. I, I want any past winners to be able to play. I think, I think that makes the tournament so much more special. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, I think there's a, and I've had this conversation a lot about previous champions getting in, whether it's for one year or five years or whatever, or a lifetime. I think there's certain tournaments where a lifetime is kind of warranted. And I think the USDGC is that there's a lot yes. of, you know, history there. It's on the same course, you know, the world championships, I kind of look at like a 10 year, um, mm. at like 10 year exemption, I think is really warranted. Um, I don't know about lifetime there for the worlds cause the worlds is, it's a little different the way that people qualify for it and stuff like that. And then the other majors, I, I think, and I look at golf the same way, you know, in ball golf, the masters is lifetime. Right. All the other ones are 10 years. Um, now you can still get good exemptions. Like they ex exempted tiger into the PGA championship this year, which I think was a great idea. Again, a lot of eyeballs on that yeah. tournament, but you know, I think in as, as far as the USDC is concerned, you need to leave it into the, uh, the mind or the heart of the champion to say, I can't keep up hundred percent. Now I'm saying right here, like I might finish last place, but I, I'm not going into the tournament thinking, boy, I, I'm just going to shoot 20 over and who cares? I might finish last place because I get nervous and just play bad, right? And everybody else plays better. But I'm going to go into it thinking my game is here. I can keep up. I can keep up pace of play, right. like all that stuff. I think you need to leave that up to the champion. And once they know, like Bernhard's saying, I can't commit to it as much, 
it's time to step away right. and, uh, you know, make way for new champions, I guess. Yeah. And even if they want to just do that, you know, throw, throw the first shot, you know, right. similar to what Augusta does with some of those guys that can't play a full round. They just come out, hit one shot. Like that's electric. I think that's a great way to start your tournament. I think that's something too, that could really help disc golf, start creating these traditions, start creating this history of past champions where right now they're just kind of like, they're almost just like these imaginary people that we hear about, but we don't ever see. Yeah. Um, so I would yeah, love to I see think that. I think Climo is a perfect example, man. Like Climo, I, what you, and you know, Kenny and, and I, and, and, you know, Yuli, I mean, we're, we're, we, we know each other. We've played a lot together. We've spent a lot of time together, you know, shit. I've stayed at champ's house. I've traveled with him. I've done all that stuff. Like, he is a living legend. Like just to see him, people that have never, people that just found the game in COVID, they, they're who's his Climo guy. Everybody knows Macbeth because Macbeth is a, also a living legend, but Climo is on another scale to that. He was the guy. Could you imagine being a nine time in a row world champion? I don't care if it was, you know, in a thousand you know, years ago, there's a lot of pressure there. And that guy stood up to that. And I just think, like you said, if it was a first tee thing or they do this little champions, you know, six hole skins or whatever, it's just cool to see him back at it. Yeah. It's a, di if it's a different aura with those guys. I remember the first time I ever saw King Climo and it was like, I was, you know, like people talk about seeing Michael Jordan for the first time, you know, NBA players. And they're like, Oh, it was like seeing a ghost. I remember being like, there was like a glow <laughs> to this guy. You know what I mean? I remember being like, Dude, he's he's like a big guy. Like that's you know that's freaking <laughs> King Climo. It's a yeah. completely different feeling for sure. And I think I think he still has that thing. When you see him on the grounds at USDGC, um, it, there's something special about him. And and having him on the pod, we had him on the podcast um, just one time, and it was one of our best podcasts. I mean, just to be able nice. to talk to him because because with people like you and King Climo, all the information that is coming out is new information with podcasts and everything that people don't get to hear about like you starting in, in Santa Cruz and then you being taught by other hall of famers. Like that's kind of, that's kind of a wild thing. It, yeah, dude, it, it really is. And that's why, you know, I, I kind of first, well, obviously I saw Kenny playing last year, but then he did that interview with Brian um, that they released on the disc golf network. And that was super cool just to hear Kenny tell the stories, hear it in his own voice, you know, just getting to see Ken again, you know, he, he had some injuries, he stepped away from the sport, but it's just, it's good to see him back, him commentating, um, at last year's USDGC, this year's chess.com. And actually, um, I don't know if this is public information, but, uh, he is on the schedule to commentate the world championship and it's going to be oh. him and I, along with Terry Miller Ooh, doing the commentary good. for the world. So, I mean, I just got goosebumps like running up my arms. Cause I remember the first time I played with Ken, like I was so in awe. And then, you know, in 2005, when I won my first worlds, he was in the lead, you know, he was in the final nine. And then the next year him and I battled and he ended up winning his 12th and so I went from being in awe to trying to have to beat his ass on the course, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and I think he liked it that way, but now that we're going to get to come back, commentate together, I'm just, I'm excited to spend five days with him and, and, you know, get to talk with him and, and get to have his input on the commentary too. I think it's gonna be fun. Yeah. It's gonna be sick courses too, which was, it's, I, I think yeah. that obviously makes the tournament is you got to have the courses right. you, there. You and know the these players. courses? Cause yeah. you, you, you're from that area, right? Or yeah, you live there? I, I lived up there for about a year. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's where, that's where foundation is. So yeah, I'm, I'm nice. up there quite often. Uh, Ivy Hills is a, is a temporary course. So that that's the one that's on the golf course there. Uh, tons of different elevation changes. It will, you know, it gets windy out there. So that will be a test. Um, obviously landing zones with the OB and everything like that. I think it'll be a great test. And then new London, I think, you know, Paul Macbeth design, I, I think it's one of the better wooded challenging courses I've played. Nice. Like I, I put yeah, it pretty know. close up to Northwood black. 
Man, yeah, um, it's one of those things because we don't like. There's not a lot of footage of these courses. I've gotten some early flyovers, so I've been able to kind of check it out. But uh, we're actually going to fly out there for the worlds to be on site. So it'll be cool to see some of these oh, holes wow. in person. And and um, yeah, I mean, yeah, the any the worlds to me. And I, and again, USDGC is the big show as well. But that World Championship. That's the one every year that just gets my my heart pumping. So I'm excited about that one. Yeah, it should be it should be a good one. Um, all right. So you <laughs> mentioned this a little while ago. I kind of want to go back to it a little bit because it is it is a topic of conversation because I think where disc golf is currently, when you compare it to like the other big four sports, let's say, those sports have been so esta- so much more established over the years, and even them you can go back 20 years and say like, look how much the game has grown in 20 years, even though they've been way more established than what disc golf has. So I th- where, where's your stance on the matter when it comes to, you know, Paul Macbeth is a perfect example. Maybe we use him as the example. I'm on the side of, I don't think Paul Macbeth has gotten worse. I just think everyone around him has gotten so much better that when he does have an off day, he doesn't win the tournament anymore by two or three. He finishes in 15th, 20th, 30th, and 40th. Um, And then there's some other people that are on the side of like, oh no, Paul's gotten way worse. He's not nearly as good as he used to be back in the day. And my thought is it's like, you know, you look at someone like Matty O, for example, Matty O's in in his late 30s. Like I, I don't think disc golf is a is a sport that oh you're like 37 like if you're a running back in the NFL and you're 37 and you're still somehow playing like that's insane you're you're <laughs> you're an insane person uh, I don't think disc golf is like that I think you can be competitive when you're 20 years old when you're 30 years old and when you're 40 years old so like where's your stance on that Yeah I mean definitely I I think when you when you when you do look let, let's just compare to golf right because it's it is somewhat similar to what we do i mean golfers can be in their mid 40s and even older and still be playing super good i mean bernard longer is a perfect example of that disc golf i i think is a little bit more fast twitch um than say golf um in a way where the club if, if you can put that club in that perfect slot that good head speed you can make it work um but yeah, I, I do think it's a young person's game um, in the sense that those fast twitch muscles are so critical that arm speed is so critical and it's just, it's the amount of, you know, hiking around, you know, like you got to get yourself up and around these courses, but yeah, I don't know, man. I just think, I, I, I do think that that mid twenties into the early thirties is the pocket That's the pocket from a physical and a mental standpoint. I remember when I was 20, like physically I could do anything. I could go play three practice rounds a day, get up the next day, do it all over again. But mentally I was a little bit young, obviously age wise, but also just, you know, didn't have a lot of life. As you get older, you get more life. You get a little bit better physical because you're stronger, you're bigger. And you now, it's that whole idea of working smarter, not harder. I think as you go on, you got to spend more time preparing your body. Well, dude, when I was 20, I, yoga, get out of here. What do you, yoga, come on. As I was 31, 32, I was doing yoga because you want to stay flexible, right? And, you know, all those things. So I just like the progression that can happen to comment on Paul. I mean, Paul set a standard that the players today are still trying to achieve. I mean, he, from a consistency standpoint, that guy, unbelievable. And, you know, but you're right. The field has risen and it just takes more work to keep up with the pack. Yeah. I think that, I think Anthony Barella actually might be for those that are trying to make the argument that, um, that like Paul has gotten worse. I think Anthony Barella actually is the best example because we talked so much about when is he going to win? When is he going to figure out how to win? If you pluck AB and you drop him back, 
Are we thinking it takes him that long to win? Yeah, probably not. It, yeah, exactly. It is, there's I mean, less people that he has to beat, right? Like that's, I mean. Right. Yeah. And, and, he, and, and obviously he's, he's physically head and shoulder. I mean, all of the physical advantages that he has, the long mm-hmm. arms, he's tall. Um, he he's faster than putt. everybody. Yep. Yeah, he's ex- exactly. He's faster than anybody. He learned how to putt like with some speed as a, as a young person. It's not like he was always struggling with putting, but I think for him, it was, it was just mentally. And, and that's where, that's where those mid thirties guys can beat players that have physical advantages because they can mentally handle the end of the round when it gets really tight in the final round you got to make one shot and that's going to win it for you. And you've had that history before the nerves aren't quite as difficult to get over. But eight to me, once a B learned the winning ways at chess.com, it was only just the damn breaking. Yeah. And now a B believes he can win. And, you know, we saw with Isaac Robinson, Isaac Robinson had won. A, he was in college doing all this stuff. He won one pro tour, and now it's a belief. It's now you have that memory of winning, and he goes on to win two majors last year. I think that's a great example as well.